My name is uh, Craig Murray, and just in case you're wondering who this Scotsman is who's wandered in and, uh, and, and is talking to you unexpectedly, um, I used to be a British ambassador. Um, in 2003, I resigned because while I was ambassador in Uzbekistan, I came across the torture and extraordinary rendition program of the CIA. So I resigned and blew the whistle uh, on that program and gave evidence to the Council of Europe inquiry led by the Swiss Senator Dick Marty, who recently passed away. Um, I then, uh, having freed myself from the shackles of being a government employee, which I'd been for more than 20 years, um, I worked with other whistleblowers and became a, a close colleague and collaborator of WikiLeaks and Julian Assange. And I want to talk to you a bit um, about Palestine, for which I've, I've campaigned my entire life, um, and the struggle for Palestine and Palestine's sovereignty, and what happened in the International Court of Justice. And I was there inside the courtroom on all two days, and I'll tell you about that. Um, and first, I wanted to just say a few words about the impact of what is happening in Palestine on Europe and what we are seeing here in the use of the issue of Palestine to crack down still further on civil liberties in Europe, which derives from the fact that there is a massive gap between the opinion of the people of Europe on Palestine and the opinion of the corrupt political elites who govern us. And because of that, they are terrified of the people they are terrified of our views, our opinion, and our strength. And we are seeing a wave of repression throughout Europe um, of people for supporting Palestine. We are also going to see, as um, the gentleman, I, I apologize, I don't recall your name, but as you said, Hamas has never, ever adopted any violence outside of Palestine. Um, that's its policy, always has been, still is. And yet we have these totally false charges brought in Germany and Denmark against young Muslims who they claim are a Hamas cell plotting terrorist violence in Germany, which is utter bullshit. It is government propaganda, and we are going to see more of it. We are going to see agile provocateur operations. We are quite possibly going to see false flag operations. We are going to see claims by governments of Palestinian violence against Europe in order for them to try to shore up the public support which is running away from the Zionist narrative. That is something I am sure we will see. Now I want to talk about uh, what's happening to people. Over a dozen friends of mine in the UK have been arrested under terrorism charges for their support for Palestine. People have been arrested for saying from the river to the sea and charged with terrorism just for saying that. I was at a WikiLeaks meeting in Iceland on the 15th of October. Uh, that day in Iceland, by coincidence, uh, there was a pro-Palestinian demonstration because the Israeli attack on Gaza had started. Uh, one of the speakers of the demonstration was a good friend of mine who is actually a former interior minister of uh, Iceland. Um, so I went along to listen to his speech and I stood in the pouring rain for a little while demonstrating for Palestine. The next day I flew back home to Scotland. I was arrested at the airport detained and questioned under the Terrorism Act. I was asked, and I'm, I'm a f former ambassador. I've never been involved in any, I'm a former rector of a university. I've never been involved in any form of violence in my life. I was detained and questioned under the Terrorism Act. My laptop was confiscated. My telephone was confiscated. I was told that because I was accused of terrorism, I was not entitled to a lawyer and it would be against the law not to answer every question put to me. I was asked about my personal finances and their sources. Um, I was asked why I had been at the Palestine demonstration in Iceland. 
I was asked what was said at the Palestine demonstration in Iceland. I said, I do not know because I do not speak Icelandic. <laughs> in a similar vein, they asked me who else was at the Palestine demonstration in Iceland. And I said, I do not know, but it's Iceland, so I have no doubt that Eric Eriksson and John Johnson and Bjorn Bjornesson were, uh, <laughs> were, were there. Um, anyway, after a couple of hours of this, uh, this questioning, I was released and told, uh, I received a letter two days later to say, I am under investigation for terrorism. Um, I spoke to my lawyers and they said, why don't you go on holiday to Switzerland? Uh, <laughs> So I did, and I've been here for the last four months. Um, but uh, I make light of it, but I am a political exile because of my support for um, Palestine. Friends of mine are in jail because of their support for Palestine awaiting trial. This is the use of the Palestinian issue to crack down on dissidents in Europe. And as I say, we are going to see more of it. So be ready. Now, I want to talk now about the International Court of Justice. Um, I had written a couple of articles in uh, November and October arguing that a state must invoke the Genocide Act because this is the way we can get action internationally. The International Criminal Court is a Western tool. It will never do anything. It's extremely corrupt and it's... Chief Prosecutor Kareem Khan is more than extremely corrupt. He's one of the most corrupt men going. Uh, so we will never see anything from the International Criminal Court. It's a complete waste of time. Historically, the International Court of Justice has not been so corrupt, has been a little more open, and I was a little more hopeful we will see something from that. Um, I was engaged with others in a lobbying campaign uh, to get states... To, try to take the action South Africa has taken. Uh, I don't claim uh, that uh, you know, I personally was responsible for South Africa taking the action, but I was certainly part of a movement that put the idea forward to the South African government, so I decided I should be there. And I, uh, I, as I can't go home to Scotland anyway, I have to be somewhere. Uh, uh, so I arrived at The Hague, uh, for the trial. Uh, in the public gallery, there are only 14 seats available at the International Court of Justice. 14 seats. Um, so I got a hotel as close to the court as I could. And at 10 o'clock in the evening, I went to see if there was a queue yet. Because I, I went to see them the day before. And they said, you have to be here at 6.30 in the morning. That's when we give out the tickets for the public gallery. And I said, if I come at 6.30, will that be OK? And they said, there may be a queue. So at 10 o'clock in the evening, I went to check the gate, and there was no queue. I went back at 11, and there was no queue. I went back at 12, and there was no queue. I went back at 1 in the morning, and there was no queue. At 2 in the morning, I went back, and there was a queue of eight people already for 14 seats. So I thought, bloody hell, I've got to stay here now. <laughs> so I started queuing at 2 a.m., and it was minus seven degrees that day in The Hague. I stood there in minus seven degrees for four and a half hours uh, in the queue with other people. And I should say all the people in the queue had come along uh, to support Palestine. But I, I got into the court. Once I got in, they said we were allowed to take in a notebook, but we were not allowed to take in a pen or a pencil. <laughs> And I said, why can't we take in a pen or a pencil? And they said, you could use it as an offensive weapon. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I, I actually felt uh, quite proud that at my age I looked so dangerous I could kill somebody with a pencil. But um, anyway, so I arrived without a pencil. Um, despite that, I managed to uh, take some notes and produce a written report of the proceedings. And I would like to tell you something about being there because, and I should say, I did this two nights running. So I was in the court, both for the South African uh, case and for the Israeli defense. And it felt like a historic moment. It really did. It felt like 
you were there as something profound was happening. And that's partly because of the South African case, which was so powerful. It set out the terrible evidence of genocide that we all know. And it was beautifully done because they did it in words and in legal argument. Uh, it said, can you please wrap up for Q&A? Uh, no, it took me three hours to get here, and I've taken for seven minutes, and the last speaker spoke for 20, so I'm going to speak for another five at least. Um, <laughs> the, uh, it, um, the South African case was put forward beautifully, powerfully in words, and they didn't use atrocity photographs, which they could have done. They made a point of not doing that. They said, we're not here for shock, we're not here for theatre, we are here to make a legal case. And it was extremely strong and compelling. And when particularly the Irish barrister spoke of the casualties and the suffering of the civilian population, you could hear a pin drop. And there were people in the court who had tears in their eyes. Uh, the South Africans took the opposite way. Uh, they told atrocity story after atrocity story from the 7 October. So I apologize, but the Israelis took the opposite case. They told atrocity story after atrocity story from the 7 October. They attempted to shock as much as they possibly could. Uh, but the basis of their defense uh, was that this is an armed conflict, and there are always civilian casualties in armed conflict. And I want you to think about that. They said this was an armed conflict, on the other hand, they said they could not stop, they must continue, because Hamas was still firing at Israeli troops and firing rockets. Well, yes, it's an armed conflict. You know, the, the claim by Israel that this is an armed conflict in which only one side is allowed to shoot, and if the other side fires back, it is terrorism. And that actually is reflected in the position of all Western governments, which deny the right of the Palestinians to defend themselves against genocide. And I think it is extremely important that we say that in international law, an occupied people has the right of resistance. Armed resistance is the right of every occupied people, and it is the right of the Palestinians. That is essential. The notion that all military action by Palestinians uh, is terrorism and the delegitimization of self-defense by Palestinians is fundamental to the denial of Palestinian sovereignty. And I want very briefly, and I promise I'll be very brief, to come to the idea of the two-state solution and what Biden and Netanyahu were discussing two days ago, where Netanyahu, having ruled out a two-state solution, Biden got him to agree that there's a possible thing called a two-state solution where Palestine has no military and no army and no sovereignty. And I want to tell you this. There is no two-state solution to this problem. The idea of a two-state solution is nonsense. The people who put forward the two-state solution do not actually even believe in it. What they want is what we had with apartheid South Africa, with the idea of the so-called homelands. If you remember, Bobo Tatswana was, was declared an inter independent homeland. And these are puppet states which have no military, no independent foreign policy, no control of their own borders or populations, and which are used simply to deprive the voting rights from, in that case, the black population, and to be used as a source of cheap labor for people coming in to the metropolitan state. That is what they are trying to repeat in Israel with the so-called two-state solution. It is not the end of Israeli apartheid. 
what they think of as a two-state solution in which Palestine is a demilitarized, controlled puppet state. That is the entrenchment of Israeli apartheid, not the end of Israeli apartheid. You cannot have a two-state solution where Palestinians are deprived of 85% of their land and only have 15% of the land, where they are under control, where they are cut off from sources of natural resources and where their lands are not contiguous. It is a nonsense. There is only one solution to this question in the Middle East, and that is a single independent state of Palestine covering all the lands of Palestine and Israel, which is democratic and secular and blind to race and ethnicity. That is the answer we must support.